Hello and welcome to Lost in Sci-Fi and Fantasy. I'm your host Leo, and today we are talking about Daughter of the Deep by Rick Riordan. It's been a while coming. I had decided that if I was going to do an episode on Daughter of the Deep, I needed to have a bit more knowledge on 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, because while it's a book that does stand out on its own, you feel like you're missing out on the reference, you know? It's one of those feelings that you get when you know someone talks about something that sounds kind of interesting, and you kind of get curious, but you, you just you haven't experienced it yet, so you, you, you don't know. Until you do, and then you can kind of be in on the joke or whatnot. In this case, the the joke, I guess, is is just the general knowledge of Twenty Thousand Leagues Under the Sea and Jules Verne stuff. When you are reading Daughter of the Deep, you kind of feel like it's making a lot of reference to the stuff in the books or something. And something I was curious about was: is it making more references to the books or the movie or what? Because in the beginning of this book, there's a foreword and an introduction. The foreword is just like this little, this little seemingly unrelated story by someone I don't know, to, to be completely fair. And then the introduction is kind of the backstory of this book's creation, which I find kind of interesting. And it... I'll go ahead and read you the first paragraph because the rest of it's just kind of breaking down what 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is to to get people caught up. Because I do understand the problems that Rick Rorden faced when making this book. He is making a technical sequel to a book that is over, well over, a hundred years old. So he, he's kind of facing a bit of an issue there. And there's the big question of, will his target demographic even know what the hell he's talking about? Because he's talking about both a book that's super old and a Disney film that's super old. Um, but here, here's the first paragraph. My journey under the sea started in landlocked Bologna, Italy, in 2008. It was there for a children's book fair, right before the Battle of the Labyrinth and the 39 Clues, The Maze of Bones, were scheduled for release. I was having dinner in the basement of a restaurant with about 14 of the top brass from Disney Publishing. When the president of the division turned to me and said, Rick, is there any existing Disney intellectual property you would love to write about? I didn't hesitate in saying 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. It took me another 12 years before I was ready to write it, but my version of that story is now in your hands. So, when discussing like Disney intellectual property and going to 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, technically, they they do own the rights to the film, so that there's that. They don't really hold the rights to the book, because the book is public domain. Going into this book, I was kind of confused. Firstly, I was like, okay, cool, he's doing another ocean book. He sure does love the ocean. And I was like, cool, it's, you know, based off of 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. That's awesome. You know, I like the concept of it, because at the time, I hadn't read it. Or watched the film. So I read the book, and I was very surprised to see, one, the, the foreword and the introduction, because usually he doesn't have those in his book. That put me off the on the off foot to begin, because I was like, that's weird. That's not normal for a Rick Warden book, but okay, let's press on. <laughs> then things happen in the book, but we'll, we'll push those aside for now <laughs> when we get to the the story uh, recap. Then after I had finished reading it, I decided to go on to Disney Plus and watch the Disney 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea to see, you know, if I could see what they were describing in the book. And the answer is kinda? Not really. Sorta. <laughs> well, not quite. <laughs> and then I read the book to try to see if there was more like, in the in the original book that he might have been taking inspiration from. You know, fair enough. That makes sense. Uh, and the answer is... Kind of? Not really. Sort of. Well, not quite. <laughs> so, uh, I did... This is one of the few episodes that I actually properly take notes on. <laughs> so, uh, I technically have two sets of notes. One is the one I used for the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea uh, thing. Just so I have additional... Uh, bits and bobs to discuss 
And then I also have uh, the bits and bobs specifically pertaining to the origins of concepts in Daughter of the Deep. And it's broken up into three categories. Mysterious Island, the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea movie, and the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea book. And then I also have a, an extra category on the back, which is just unknown. <laughs> Fuck if I know. So, let's kind of run through it. A lot of the concepts do technically come from the Mysterious Island. Uh, it, it's, a, it's very weird, because the basic concept of the book is that the two sets of protagonists from each book, 20,000 Leagues on the Sea and Mysterious Island, broke off and made schools to try to replicate Nemo's technology. One founded by Ned Land, and one founded by Harding and Pencroft from Mysterious Island. We follow uh, Anna Dakar, who is attending Harding Pencroft. There's a lot of jokes that I'll, I'll talk about later. But we follow her, and so it, it, it's It's weird. <laughs> So the concepts that are from Mysterious Island is, in Mysterious Island, there's a dog named Top. There's an orangutan named Jupiter. Uh, it it talks about Nemo's final resting place because it's the book in which Nemo dies. Harding and Pencroft. And then Nemo's multiple bases. And that's kind of a, a tenuous uh, one because I'm pretty sure when Jules Verne was writing it, he intended the base that they end up landing on the mysterious island to be the same one as the one described in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. But I can see how you can extrapolate it to it being multiple bases. But moving that on, uh, the things that come from the movie, as far as I can tell, though it seems to be slightly adapted and tweaked, and we'll get to that also in a minute, uh, the underwater farms, the Nautilus design, technically... Uh, the Nautilus is inconsistent in design between like the cover of the book and the the little picture provided inside. The picture inside looks like the silhouette is the same as the the movie uh, Nautilus, but the description in the book, as well as pretty much everything going on inside of the Nautilus, is pretty much different. The reason for Ned Ned Land and Professor Aranax to kind of not like Nemo. Because in the book, Ned Land and Professor Aranax, even especially Consul and Professor Aranax, absolutely adore Nemo for most of the book. Ned Land gets you know irritable because he's he's more and more seeing himself as a prisoner instead of a weird combination of prisoner and um, guest. He's more and more seeing himself as a prisoner and feeling closed inside a metal box until he finally you know you know they burst and escape. But in the movie, there's a lot more contempt coming from Ned Land. So you can see him, you know, being super angry. Though I don't see a harpooner, no matter how famous he is, uh, getting enough riches to, to, to open a school. Except for, theoretically, in the film, he is depicted as trying to steal uh, his treasures. So you could, you know, extrapolate that to he did steal some treasure. I don't know. The electrified hull uh, and the ship's power source are also something that kind of comes from the film a bit. It's changed a bit between books. In 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, it is pulling sodium out of the water and using that as a power source. While in Daughter of the Deep, it's just straight cold fusion. Like, yeah, <laughs> pulling hydrogen out of the water and fusing it together to create energy. And, you know, that's cool. It, it's a, a nice kind of, you know, translation across. Um, but where you kind of get it coming from the film is, in the film, it's not explained at all. Literally, like, <laughs> Professor Aranax is put in front of, like, or put behind this like weird semi helmet uh, iron shield, and then Captain Nemo opens a like a shutter that blasts <laughs> some like energy out, kind of implying some kind of nuclear you know 
something happening in there. But it's never explained in the movie, so it's easy to extrapolate from there. Uh, and then Nemo's unknown inventions. I'm willing to credit that to the film, at least partially. Um, because it is heavily implied in the film that Nemo has a ton more wonderful, just amazing inventions at his base. But he... Um, uh, he has to destroy them because, whoops, uh, the, the location of the base has been spoiled. So th there's that. Then the things that I can definitely say come from the book is the guns, Ned Land and Professor Aranax, and then some of the ship design. That's about it. <laughs> That's all I can really say. Because, <laughs> yeah, it, it's it feels like a lot more of it comes from like the mysterious island than 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea which I find a bit odd for what is supposed to be technically a sequel to that, but y you have to tie them together because it does, you know, they're both Nemo stories. The biggest issue is uh, Jules Verne was very inconsistent with uh, timeline because 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, you know, is set as a, at a time, and then it's supposed to go to the Mysterious Island, but Mysterious Island like history wise is set before 20,000 leagues under the sea. <laughs> Cause in 20,000 leagues under the sea, it's mentioned, you know, about Abraham Lincoln, I believe Abraham Lincoln's assassination, um, the civil war, all of that happening. And then in mysterious Island, it is set during the civil war because Harding Pencroft and I guess a handful of others, you know, escape on a, a balloon to uh, to ac accidentally land on the mysterious island. So that that's that's something. <laughs> but putting that aside and just kind of ignoring the weird, uh, bad timeline writing from Jules Verne, treating it as if it is one fluid story is kind of the best way to go go about it. Um, then we have the handful of things that don't really have an explanation and are, are are just really wild uh interpretations from rick Rorden. uh the nemo only tech in daughter of the deep there is a lot of alt tech as they call it in the book uh that requires the dna of a direct descendant of captain nemo uh that's nowhere in in the book <laughs> It, it's just not, not a thing. Uh, why? I, mean, I guess it would make some sense if he knew he would have a descendant. Otherwise, it's not very clear. I mean, I guess it would be a like safeguard against the potential of, you know, someone stealing the ship. No one can steal the ship if they can't pilot it. <laughs> Because it requires, you know, his DNA. Speaking of, um, <clears throat> part of controlling the ship requires an organ. In 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, the original book, and to an extent, but not really, in the movie, there is an organ in the Nautilus. It's, you know, a, it's, a, it's a set piece, of course. But it is specifically in the like grand saloon in 20 it's sorry in daughter of the deep they moved the organ from the grand saloon to like rick Rorden moved it from the grand saloon to the uh the bridge which instead of being like just a little helm space for one person to pilot the nautilus it's like a, like a cockpit it it's now a full-on like Star Trek esque bridge with like a, a center chair and everything. It, it's kind of funny, uh, but part of the way that you kind of coax the ship into doing stuff is by playing its music. Which, speaking of, the ship now has an AI, and that's again completely original. Uh, I was trying to find it. I tried my damnedest to see it in in anything. And nope, it's not there. It's completely original. Uh, and then the multiple bases. I, I, I put it in both because, again, 
I can see it being extrapolated from Mysterious Island, but it's definitely an original thought. Um, but anyway, with with all of that, the origins of bits out of the way, let's kind of go ahead and discuss my my, my general feelings on the book, uh, just to get get them out of the way. Uh, do I like the book? Yes. <laughs> I would say I like it more than the actual 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. I definitely did gain a new appreciation for this book after having slogged my way through 20,000 Leagues. It And boy was it a slog. It, it almost physically hurt me to get through 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. While this one, book, it hurts me a lot less. Do I, do I still have problems with it? Yes. It, it definitely has issues that I will get into <laughs> because it... Mm. Mm. Anyhow, do I feel that the original editions harmed the book? No, they're 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 perfectly harmless. They they add interesting levels to it. But if you care about stuff like that, then you might not like the book. <laughs> Personally, I love an Easter egg. I love seeing a thing that you know is from a different thing added in like for example or or a thing from long ago within this world's timeline brought back like in Jurassic World I was super excited when they went into the old park that made me so happy and I was super ecstatic about it I was slightly disappointed that they didn't take the opportunity to show specific things one thing I really wanted to see was them go into the kitchen and look at the look at the raptor. See if the raptor is still in the freezer. I would love to have seen that. That would have been such a hilarious, amazing callback. But sadly, the opportunity was not really taken. Which is fine. I don't mind about that. But I, I was still super happy to see them use like the old Jeep, go through the old area, see where the t-rex you know wrecked shit inside the inside the visitor center it it was all really good and i loved it and i just love stuff like that they don't fully give you that in the nautilus because most of the nautilus is kind of original in this book it doesn't really feel like you're exploring it you know with new eyes so to speak it feels it feels like, you know, a weird reconstruction. Because the Grand Saloon is there, but there's no organ because they moved he moved it to the he moved it up. You see the cruise quarters, which in the book famously you never see. You only see where uh Consul and Ned Land are staying and where Professor Aranek stays, along with Captain Nemo's quarters. <clears throat> Otherwise you don't see the crew much at all. Uh, the, and then they they add, he added like a bit more of an extra ornateness to the Nautilus, but again, when it's your own original Nautilus, which, again, fair enough. There's so many different interpretations and adaptations of the Nautilus that why not just kind of pick and choose? You have, <laughs> you you can. Uh, so he does. He makes his own Nautilus with original bits, as well as kind of picking from elsewhere. And it works. It works decently well. It's just, some of the additions don't quite land as well. Like the AI, it it brings up an interesting question that's not fully actually addressed in the book that we'll get to in a bit. So let's kind of hop into the actual like plot summary. The plot, the general st like stuff that happens in the book, can be summarized extremely fast, <laughs> and it starts like this. So Anna and her brother go for a bit of a dive. Anna knows something a bit odd about their secure the school security system. Notifies her brother. Goes for breakfast. They leave and then leaves on a field trip uh, for her kind of freshman trials which is supposed to be where you know the true test of whether or not you can make it at this school is applied. 
Then, on their way to the boat where they're going to have their trials, their school is destroyed. Completely. Uh, and because of the way that it's set up, they kind of... The school pops in and out of view as, as they're going along uh, the highway. And they, they witness the school's destruction. This happens in chapter 3. <laughs> now, the, the complete shock of this is very impactful for the book. In fact, you can describe this book as just Anna Dakar's really shit week. <laughs> just fucking awful. <laughs> because, it, literally, the time span of this book is so short <laughs> that you're just amazed all this shit happens in it. It's not like, you know, Percy Jackson and the Olympians where, you know, the the timeline's kind of justified. You know, he's given a specific date that he has to have this project done by. Where in this, I don't know, shit just keeps happening and it's all bad. <laughs> Which makes things go a lot faster. It's, a, it's not even like a short book. The book is three, I think 300... Uh, yeah, 336 pages. The book is 336 pages, and it, you're, you're able to rush through them. Because the events that happen just fly by. And the chapters are super short. There's 63 chapters, but each chapter is only like maximum 7 pages, maybe 10. Well, a lot of them are like 3 to 4. <laughs> So you, you burn through this book super fast, and it just feels like it just goes goes way too fast at times. <clears throat> so much so that you... This is going to be a similar thing whenever I get around to talking about Jurassic Park. The weight doesn't fully feel utilized when over a hundred students are just killed in the book like I was very there are so many places that I'm just very surprised Rick Warden was willing to go in this book and one of them just like mass murder was surprising <laughs> it, it was a bit of a shock because I, I really wasn't expecting just like over a hundred dead students to, to be on his bucket list for things to put in books but hey I it, it has impact. <laughs> it has impact. Uh, again, there's many different like things that he's willing that he he's willing to go to in this book, which I find surprising and I think work really well. But boy, while you do get a lot more reaction in this book than you do to the number issue in um, in Jurassic Park, the book, um, it still feels very unresolved by the end, which is part of the issue that I have with just the stupid high number of casualties in this book. Because it is stated that there are about 150 students at Harding Pencroft, plus uh, an unnumbered amount of faculty and security, you know, faculty and staff. Uh, and it's it's wiped off of the face of the map. Like, the entire school is destroyed. The cliff it's on sinks into the sea. Uh, the news broadcasts uh, that talk about it describe it as a landslide and say that over a hundred feared dead. Uh, <laughs> which, it's just an insane thing to just throw in, in chapter three. Anyway, let's go ahead and move on from that for now uh and get get on so they rush to the pier to get in, on their ship and get out to sea the entire time wondering what's happening uh their teacher escort uh finally gives them information and bit by bit then while they're trying to make their escape they get attacked by uh, as it turns out, their rival high school, the Land Institute. Uh, the attack goes down. It's found out that their target is Anna. And they're 
fended off and beaten partially by a dolphin. And then they they continue making their retreat. They get everything set up. And then it's their teacher just fucking passes out and goes into a coma. Because it turns out he had, uh, well, what they first determined was diabetes with something as an underlying condition. It turns out that underlying condition was pancreatic cancer. So he is knocked out of commission, slowly dying, and she's faced with an ultimatum. Turn around and go back to where they came, alert the authorities, and hopefully they'll believe them. Or press on to Nemo's secret base, which they literally just learned about and don't know if it actually exists. They opt for go to base. Uh, not a whole lot really happens uh, in the three day trip, uh, except uh, Anna starts her period and it's a bit of a shit time. So it's, it's literally for her shit time after shit time. And let's fucking just keep layering that shit on. It just keeps going. <laughs> it sucks for her the entire time. But they do, as they are making their approach, it is uh, Esther, who is a, the last descendant of the Harding line, uh, as the Pencroft line died the previous generation, died off the previous generation. She is the last Harding, and she lets Anna know that it, it's very likely that she will come up against a test of some sort. The base will send a test, and they have to pass it, or else get blown to smithereens. Uh, and a test is indeed sent. It is this like weird pulse thing that kind of... It, it's basically just a decrypt not decrypted, an encrypted message stating uh, respond within five hours or you'll be destroyed. <laughs> you know, keep it simple. They do. They respond at the last minute or last technically half an hour or so sending out their message saying, hey, we're this ship uh, emergency situation Anna Dakar is on board. D don't 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 fire please <laughs> they are then let in in which they are introduced to luca jupiter and ophelia the only people manning this secret base <laughs> uh it turns out that luca and ophelia knew anna's parents who died two years ago in an accident or as anna <laughs> anna's progression of finding out is she thinks that they died in an accident then it turns out they died while finding, trying to find an artifact. Then it turns out they were very likely killed by said artifact. <laughs> and it is believed that it was semi-intentional that they, they were killed. They were killed by the Nautilus itself, uh, she comes to find out around this time. They were killed because... The Nautilus got a bit spooked. The Nautilus in this version has, or in the, the Nautilus in this book has a bit of a rudimentary AI, as stated earlier, and it just got a bit spooked, and her dad, being a bit careless, rushed into the ship after the door opened immediately and got electrocuted and died instantly. Her mother tried to pull him out of the ship uh, and just pretty much daisy-chained herself to death. So when I first read that, I was like, well, that's a bit disappointing. Because <laughs> the entire book, there's this mystique around their death, as well as a different thing. We'll get to that. Uh, but there, there's this mystique around their death, and then you just find out Technically, yeah, it was an accident. Her dad was a bit of a dumb-dumb and just rushed headlong into a death trap. He, I mean, to be fair, he couldn't have known that, you know, 
the ship's electrical barrier would be on. <laughs> Oops. That, that, that is something that also, real quick side note, that slightly annoyed me, is they kind of switched the lethality of things in, in this book. In 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea, the electric bit of the ship is supposed to be non-lethal um for at least uh at least in the movie the the electro electrified hull is supposed to be non-lethal it's supposed to be harmless it gives them a bit of a shock and they they flee they go anything unwanted pests should leave but in the book i think it actually might be a little bit more lethal but it's also very obvious it, it's just a handrail so you touch it you die kind of thing I think it's still, I think it's supposed to be fairly non-lethal, generally. And the laden guns, which shoot out these, like, abalone, like, shell casings full of electricity, uh, those are supposed to be death on contact. They're, they are supposed to be extremely lethal in both book and movie it's supposed to be like dead instantly dead <laughs> it's supposed to leave no outside damage whatsoever it just stops their heart but in this it's a glorified taser so you know but there there is a bit of a asterisk to that the laden guns that they use in this book are what they were able to reverse engineer. So, it, as they say, it's a pale imitation of Nemo's actual technology. So, I can see it being weaker than they were expecting. Uh, or they purposefully made it weaker because they don't want to kill people. Uh, anyway. <laughs> so, after this, uh, Luca and... Ophelia kind of try to coax uh, Anna into opening the Nautilus. or Well, not opening the Nautilus. They already have it open, and they've been able to go in and out of it. That's why they were so confused as to her parents' death, is because th they weren't 100% sure what the fuck happened. <laughs> so, because they were able to go into it just fine. Though, you know, the Nautilus gets a bit grumpy. So, she is able to talk with it. It doesn't immediately kill her. Then they, they're able to get the entire crew in to clean out the Nautilus. And the Nautilus kind of becomes better throughout, I guess. Through the cleaning process. Plus being serenaded with some spooky Bach music. <laughs> because, why not? Uh, anyhow. After this, they... After they get it nice and clean and tidy and get what repairs they could done, they're getting ready to do a test dive when uh, Land Institute finds them. They, before, found out that Land Institute has their own submarine, what they call the Aranax, named after Professor Aranax, which I find odd because Professor Aranax was the number one Nemo fanboy in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Sure, at the very end of the book, he's like, eh, eh, he's a bit odd. I'm going to go ahead and just leave. He, throughout most of the book, he's like, hell yeah, fucking let's go <laughs> to the South Pole, to the South Pole. <laughs> he's super hyped the entire time. Uh, so it's a bit weird that they used his name to name the sub. <laughs> So, they, the Aranax attacks the base. They scramble to get into the Nautilus to make an escape. And they, they try to kind of pull the Aranax's attention away. And then they scuttle away super fast using some theoretical technology. <laughs> To explain... This this was Rick Rorden's way of explaining the 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea uh, title. Because 
of course, as brought up in this book, as every obvious thing is brought up in this damn book at times, I'll get to it. <laughs> there is uh, the common misunderstanding that 20,000 leagues under the sea means that people misinterpret it as that's how deep under the sea Nemo went. But if that was true, he would be halfway to the moon already. Uh, because it's actually, he traveled a distance of 20,000 leagues while under the sea in a submarine. The only issue is, I don't think that that's fully true. My, my best guesstimation is that, because 20,000 leagues under the sea is about eight revolutions, like going, I guess, around the equator. That's eight trips around the equator, a little bit over. Some say seven. It, the, the number shifts for some reason. But regardless, it's a lot. For my best estimation, following the plot, the pathway of the book, they only made it a theoretical four-ish trips around the Earth in distance. Because one, they, they actually only go around once they start in the pacific around the sea of japan they work their way around the pacific a little bit then they go through down to like papua new guinea and australia up through uh what was it the the philippines then they go under india up next to africa into the red sea they go under Suez, go through the Mediterranean, out, go up the coast of Spain and Portugal, then flip a Yui, book it south, down to the South Pole, go straight to the South Pole, then again, chuck a Yui, and go back up north following the coast of the Americas all the way up to about Canada. Then they recross the Atlantic, go down around Fran uh, France or Spain, settle there for a bit, and then they book it north again, heading towards uh, Norway. And then that's where the book ends. And by my best like kind of figuring... That would only be around four, even including like them actually diving. And like, if you include the depths and whatnot, I still don't think they traveled that far. <laughs> I could be wrong though. I don't know. But the explanation for like Nemo disappearing in one place and reappearing in one another, which he didn't really do in the book, he kind of does, but he doesn't. Like, I think the Nautilus in the book reaches like a top speed of. I think like 20 knots, 25 knots at the fastest. But it's explained through this theoretical technology. They use it, blast off, and end up near the Mariana Trench. They get a little too friendly with uh, enamored octopus or squid. I think it is. I think it's actually it's supposed to be like a giant squid, similar to what happens in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. They get... A little too close to it. <laughs> then they book it back to the island uh, with squid in tow. And they defeat, they defeat Land Institute through a mixture of sea battle and land battle. Where they have to technically do a bit of an infiltration on their own base... To clear out the base and, you know, get the job done. Twists happen. Uh, I don't think, yeah, you know, everyone comes out pretty much unscathed. Except uh, the Aranax submarine is completely destroyed. <laughs> and then the book ends. Now let's get into a little bit more detail. <laughs> but not too much, because, you know, we're getting close to... To where we need to be. So the details. I mean, overall, again, not bad. It just goes by so fast. 
Like, th that last bit that I told you, them, them getting attacked by the Aranax, fleeing and coming back, c constitutes the, the rest of the book from about page 214 all the way to page uh, 336. So over 100 pages of the book is dedicated to this, and they go by very fast. <laughs> Because they're they're really tightly action packed. Uh, my annoyances. I have many little annoyances. There's almost at least one annoyance per chapter in this book. There's almost always something that just mm. <laughs> I read it and I go ugh. And let's start with the the references. The book just. At times, just can't ref re just can't resist a, a juicy little reference to other things. And the one that Rick Warden seems the most proud of is a Harry Potter joke, because the initials for the school, Harding Pencroft Academy, is HP, and he says it. He says it in his introduction. He says it. <laughs> he says it in like the first fucking chapter of the book and I think it comes up again later on it's just annoying then there's also the Nemo, Nemo but not the fish that comes up too many times as well it you know like I, I get it like there's a very good chance that your audience doesn't even know what 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea is. But at the same time, who cares? They'll pick it up through context, especially since you reference the books multiple times in this book. Because in this book, both the books, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea and The Mysterious Island, exist, but they are more novelizations of truth so Jules Verne met Ned Land and Professor Aranax and they relayed their story to him and he wrote it down changed some bits here and there and then speculated on others and then published it then shortly after that he was contacted by Harding and Pencroft who wanted to correct the record and paint Nemo in a more positive light because they feared that, you know, if if they were to, one, safeguard Nemo's legacy, and two, uh, you know, keep the tech, keep everything potentially viable to, like, actually be released eventually, they needed Nemo's name to have better connotations to it. So Harding built, Harding and Pencroft built one school, Ned Land built another. Ned Land's goal is to take the Ned Land and his academy's goal is to take the technology and dominate the world supposedly which is weird but yeah well Harding and Pencroft's goal is to safeguard the technology and ever slow slowly leak it when the time is right um where supposedly like the the idea for a uh, nuclear fusion, sorry, not fission, nuclear fission, uh, was leaked in the 40s to help the Manhattan Project, and they still deemed it a good ish thing despite the, you know, decades long Cold War that followed. <laughs> and, you know, the current nuclear arm armaments that are currently held by many countries currently. <laughs> They still deem it as a net positive, but, you know, it's still a bit shaky. Harding and Pencroft are very, the, at least the school, is very tight-fisted when it comes to this because they are very worried about what either uh, governments or companies might do with these things. So they have, like, an almost unlimited food supply because they take everything from the sea. They grow everything under the sea. Um, if they were to eat meat, they would, you know, 
do f eat fish and shit. <laughs> but but they don't cuz uh they they claim that you know Nemo hunted stuff for meat uh early on but by the time he mysterious island uh he became what we would call a vegetarian which i mean yeah that that works that's fine <laughs> but anyway they, they 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 do that but they they're scared of what like again the unlimited food supply is like okay yeah, we could, you know, give this to the world and end world hunger, but companies might uh, stamp it out because they want to make a profit. Or governments might, you know, regulate it to death to where it, you know, gets stuck because they're testing the safety of it. You know, it, it a lot of issues. That's a, a thing. <laughs> but some of his things, like the microwave, I'm like, yeah, really, you're, you're going to credit him with something as benign as a microwave oven like <laughs> that's a bit silly but anyway other gripes i have so her her asides her in, internal monologue sucks one of her specific asides is to do with gemini twain gemini twain is this book's equivalent of Clarice in the early Percy Jackson books, or he, he's supposed to be like the bully character, kind of, except for he isn't. It's a, a concept that I believe Rick Rorden was trying to subvert, but in doing so made Anna and her friends seem like complete assholes. So Gemini Twain is the prefect for the shark house. Harding Pencroft is split into houses. That's part of what makes the Harry Potter joke much deeper. Not really. <laughs> But it's split into houses, shark, dolphin, orca, and cephalopod. And Anna is part of the dolphin, her friend, uh, Nehelina, or Nelina. I, I, I only read her name in the book, and it's weird saying it out, is part of the cephalopods. And her friend Esther is part of the orcas. And supposedly within about the first two months or so of their what they call the chum year, which is the year before they become freshmen. Jem, which is his nickname, Jem approaches their table, and he asks a bit of a dumb question, but it's because, understandably, he doesn't know anything about them, and he asks Nelina, are you the scholarship kid? And this is supposedly enough of an offense for them to basically hate him for two years now i have a theory that is slightly backed up but not 100 percent supported that the only person keeping this feud rivalry hatred burning is anna that, that's my theory because the interactions between melina and uh jem are pretty benign Basically, it just seems like, you know, this incident, incident made it to where they weren't ever going to be friends, and so she just kept her distance. But, you know, that's about it. Like, she'll have basic conversations with him here or there, but other than that, no. But Anna treats it as if them talking is a sign of the end times. Them agreeing is, you know... Round up your dogs, round up your kids, get the fuck out of here, something bad's coming. But the book, like, the interaction itself is so, like, minimal, you're just like, okay, they talked, good. It's not like, you know, she says this with a pained expression or anything. No, it's just, they, they talk normally. And Anna's just freaking out in her mind, like, oh my god, a huge thing just happened, when it's, it, no. I feel that Rick Rorden wanted to have him be both, like, the the redeemed bully, like Clarice was in, in the Percy Jackson series, but also didn't want to make him actually ever really be mean. Like, he's a bit strict when it comes to, like, following the rules and whatnot, but other than that... That's it. And he made 
a, a bit of an oopsie daisy on the first day. And the book, the book states at multiple points throughout it certain things. One, they were on a bit of a truce. You know, they, they had made some minor amends, but Anna, it, it stated that Anna's pretty much still holding the you hurt my friends, you hurt me uh, mentality, which is a bit much. It is also revealed that Jem has apologized to Nalina multiple times. And I, I, I don't know, because it doesn't state if she has ever actually accepted his apology or anything. I think she's just left it sitting there. But it doesn't seem like that big of an offense. Like, I, I, I understand that, especially in, like, schools, getting labeled with anything, you know, uh, it's the popsicle kid. It sticks for a while, at the very least. I mean, to be fair, I had a stupid nickname throughout most of the time. I rolled with it. I just rolled with it. But the thing is, it it's something that they say that it stuck with her for a year. Although, it doesn't seem like it did. Because if it stuck with her for a year, it would have just stuck. I'm pretty sure what happened is she got super offended by it. Again, understandable. And then it just faded away. Like, it was just a bit of an incident where he said something a bit stupid, and then it faded away. So, I don't know, it, it's my biggest grievance with the book. It's my biggest annoyance, because they treat it like a big thing throughout this entire book when it's an incident that happened two years ago, and the only one that seems to actually still care about it is Anna. And to a lesser extent, Jem. Because I'm pretty sure he was just telling her so that she knew his side of the story and whatnot. His side of the story is as simple as this. He comes from a Mormon family. His parents abandoned him with his grandmother. His grandmother brought him into the Mormon church. From there, uh, his brother, when he became of age, went on a mission to Brazil. Gemini, Twain, wanting to, you know... Forge new friendships, and using his only connection that he had left, his brother, uses that to try to make friends with Nalina and, you know, her group. By asking the simple question of, are you the scholarship kid from Brazil? Because that's all he knew about them. And he asks, do you know my brother? He was sent on a mission there. You know he's he was in this area. How is you know how is that place and whatnot? He he just continues the conversation because he's he's curious. He wants to know. He's trying to make friends, and he just accidentally stepped on the one landmine it seemed, and it's held made a grudge that lasted over two years. Uh, other than that, I really like Gemini's character. He's actually, you know, he's loyal. He tries to do his job. He fucking fails at it the first time. Because he's too focused on the very obvious, you know, faint attack. <laughs> Whoops. Uh, but he, he, you know, sticks close to Anna like he's assigned to do. And then they have a few, like, sweet moments and whatnot. It, it's overall nice. And you can see that Anna's, the again, the only one holding on to this issue. And it just does like... <laughs> She's pretty much using it as an excuse not to get close to, to Gemini Twain for no real reason, I guess. Um, then there's her rivalry with the ship. As I said before, it killed her parents. So she then gets kind of unnecessarily mad at a machine that was awoken after 150 years, covered in gook, having a lot of its, like, processes and whatnot just slowed and fogged by the amount of just garbage inside of it rotting away it panicked a bit and accidentally killed her parents whoopsie doodle she holds it so hard against the ship for so long in the book at least it feels like so long technically it's a relatively short bit of the book but it's, it's still oh god they come to an understanding eventually 
Then there's kind of their use of Esther. Esther is my favorite character in the book, I think. She is... Uh, she is the last Harding. She has some form of autism. I don't know exactly because, you know, autism is a spectrum. You can be on one end or the other end and anywhere in between. So she's somewhere in there. She has a, a nice emotional support dog. She is very blunt to the point. Uh, doesn't get sarcasm. Most of her... Her use for the like first half of the book is that she, being the last Harding, holds some additional secrets. Like she knew what happened to Anna's parents. She knew about the island and the alt tech and whatnot. She just couldn't tell anyone. Uh, and she, one of her uh, coping mechanisms for her anxiety is uh, she writes on color coded note cards and. Uh, she writes down top secret stuff on note cards, which is not a great thing. <laughs> but anywho, uh, so she or she's kind of a secret dispenser in the in the first half of the book, and in the second half of the book, she becomes the they call it the ship's interpreter because her her sense of empathy and whatnot as being an empath she is able to understand what the ship is feeling like oh she likes that oh she doesn't like that and whatnot uh, or do don't say that kind of thing it's a bit weird because she's kind of just relegated to that she doesn't do a whole lot of like her house's stuff because i don't know it's listed at the beginning of the book what orcas are supposed to do for most of the book, they're they're just kind of used as um, medics, really, and that's kind of what they're they're generally deemed as through most of the book is medics, because two of them are constantly switching out uh, to help uh, the professor, who's you know K KO'd throughout most of the book. Okay, so House Orca is medicine, psychology, education, marine biology. And communal memory. So they use her a little bit for that, but not really. Only like they identify like one fish or something, and then uh, for the most part, she she is there for like the psychology, but mostly just the psychology of sometimes the people around, but mostly just the mostly just the boat, <laughs> mostly just the Nautilus. <clears throat> but yeah, so it, it, it's just weird that she gets relegated to that uh, to that role. But it it works, I guess. Uh, other issues. Oh, the 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 twist. The twist is that Anna's brother is alive. Anna's brother, Dev is the one who sabotaged the security system of Harding Pencroft. He got in contact with the Land Institute and he was willing to put forth uh, in efforts to take control of the Nautilus. Because, it, as hinted throughout the book, uh, he was told... Uh, around the same time that uh, around the age that Anna is now 14 going on 15 about what happened to their, their parents and as well as what is you know happening with Harding Pencroft that the Nautilus exists and whatnot and he wanted to immediately go but Harding Pencroft said no you wait then he's like fine uh after graduation and they're like eh, could you at least push it off until after college so that you can gain some additional like emotional maturity and whatnot to you know take control of this ship that seems a bit temperamental 
and he agrees, but he gets antsy and whatnot. So he gets in contact with Land Institute and comes up with a deal in order to take over the Nautilus. Uh, and he he does try to give uh, the Harding Pencroft a fair warning before the school's destruction, but he is unsure whether or not they actually uh, did it, whether or not people took it seriously and escaped. So there is very likely a really high chance that still over a hundred people just fucking died. It still it still baffles me every single time I think about it. But anywho, so he is the one that's captain captaining the Aeronox, the enemy submarine ship, and he is he's he's been hunting Anna using the gift he gave her on the day of their dive. That being a black pearl necklace that, or a necklace with a singular black pearl that was the, like, crowning jewel of her mother's, uh, like, wedding necklace. Uh, he has placed a tracker in that necklace and has been following them around, keeping an eye on them. And they use that to follow them to the island, and that's how he... He prepared the attack. The book ends after they had defeated the Aranax and, you know, cleared out the base of the people and whatnot. The book ends with Anna taking Dev in the Nautilus down to their parents' final resting place. Because when their parents died, they were cremated and laid to rest in at the bottom of the lake. And it's a very emotional scene, but that's where the book ends. Is her pretty much saying that you know, you didn't have you definitely didn't have the emotional maturity to to control this ship. If you were willing to do all of this, you didn't have the power to do it. You didn't have the right to do it. And so, with that, the book just ends. With a bunch of questions hanging in the air. Like, Land Institute still exists. So what are they going to do next? Um, they still have the potential and hope of rebuilding the school. Will they? Who knows? They have to technically rebuild large chunks of the base. Will they? Who fucking knows? Because this book is currently only a standalone when it was announced, it was announced as a standalone. And when I read that, I thought, oh, he means standalone as in it is not related to the Percy Jackson series at all. Because, you know, most of his books nowadays are related to the Percy Jackson series in some way or another. This is the first book in a long time that's completely separate. It has nothing to do with Percy Jackson. Although technically it's still sea themed, so it kind of has a little bit to do with Percy Jackson, but not anywhere directly. Ocean. Ocean is the only connecting bit there. Um, and whether or not this will get a sequel, what that sequel will consist of, or anything, is still up in the air. Right now, it's looking kind of unlikely, because one, he's releasing a new Percy Jackson book at the end of this year, and he could end up releasing more. Who knows? Like, so far, it's a standalone Percy Jackson and the Olympians book, number six in that particular line, I believe set after Heroes of Olympus. I, I don't know. It's called Chalice of the Gods. But it seems like he's going to continue on with that. So I don't know if he's going to do a sequel to Daughter of the Deep. But it is getting a movie, and that is something that I definitely agree with. This would actually be really good as a movie. It's... The plot of it goes by so fast when you're reading it that it it could be a movie. If you cut out all of her inner dialogue, the entire Gemini Twain like conflict between her him and her friend, because that goes nowhere in the book. 
if you cut all that out, it would probably be the length of like a Hollywood script. And I think it would work really well as a Hollywood script. And I believe it's going to Netflix, I think. I believe they, they got the contract for it. And I think, again, it'll be really good as one. So I think it'll be really good as a movie. And I recommend that if you want to read this, go ahead. It, it's good. <laughs> you know, the, there's an audiobook version of it. There's probably going to be a comic book adaptation because Rick Rorden likes to do that with uh, with his books. <laughs> but I definitely recommend that when this comes out as a movie, if it's, you know, loyal to the book, it'll be good. If it's not super loyal to the book, that's also technically fine. But I think... I think it being fairly loyal to the book would be good. But, yeah, anywho, with that, oh, I have finally vented about Daughter of the Deep. <laughs> when I was first uh, kind of prototyping this podcast, I had actually done a Daughter of the Deep episode, but uh, it didn't come out the way I really wanted it to. And it was super short. Uh, but now now that I've kind of gotten into the groove of this podcast, I, I'm more equipped to tackle it. Uh, I'll probably do a similar thing, because also during the prototype, I recorded a Jurassic Park episode on the book Jurassic Park. And it also didn't quite go the way I had wanted. But now that I got my, my rambly style down, notice how neat and organized this podcast is. Just ignore the fire. Uh, you know, th things have gone smoother. A bit smoother. Not not super smooth. A bit smoother. And I'm mostly happy with the way things have gone. Uh, now, uh, yeah. <laughs> now, now I'm pretty pretty happy with how things things are going. Anywho. <laughs> That is it for today. Uh, again, I do recommend the book. Uh, do recommend it when it comes out as a movie. Uh, but also, I would kind of recommend Rick Warden's other books. Because they are able to push past the first book issue. I think it's just that Rick Warden has a bit of a first book issue. Because when you're trying to get into a first book of the series... You're introduced to characters and concepts, and you're stuck in the mind of one person. It's rough. The first, like, well, all five Percy Jackson books, like the Percy Jackson and the Olympians books, I have issues with. Because all five of them uh, have bits where Percy's just a bit of a whiny asshole. Where the Heroes of Olympus books, I'm more fine with, because one, it switches perspective constantly so you get a fresh perspective on the situation you know every chapter it's nice uh but we'll, we'll talk about that stuff later anyway <laughs> thank you guys so much for listening uh next week is terminal man because i've already recorded it and posted it and it's just waiting for this episode to go out and then a week after that it yeah you, you know how this works anyway next week is terminal man i will talk to you guys later uh, goodbye